When my editors asked me to come down here and do this story, I thought it was a really interesting opportunity to come down and drive this Cunningham because it's the kind of car I've heard about and you can make a lot of assumptions about it based on its track record at Le Mans, finishing third in 1953. Briggs Cunningham, designer and driver of powerful sports cars. Many American families go to France as tourists, but the Cunningham mission is to bring home the first American winner of the international road race, the Grand Prix d'Auderance, or simply Le Mans. Mr. Cunningham was sitting down in West Palm Beach with his car manufacturing facility, and they were trying to race at Le Mans, a major global race of preeminent importance. It was just a very, very small factory, and it was funded 100% by Mr. Cunningham. I can say that he is one of the, the towering exemplars of this idea of fair play, impeccable sportsmanship and politeness, but fiercely contested, and that was Mr. Cunningham in a nutshell. The high hopes of a man, a company, and perhaps of a new national industry ride in these cars. He took a run at it, and I don't think there's ever been another individual who has mounted an effort to win at Le Mans on the scale and the scope and the sheer persistence that Mr. Cunningham has. It's up to Cunningham to beat the blistering Jaguar pace if he is going to win. Mr. Cunningham needed to find sources of technical inspiration to keep raising his game. And the C5 is probably the most radical of all of his cars. It's like an indie roadster. And at the time when the car showed up at Le Mans, all the uh, journalists and self-appointed experts said, oh, zut alors, what is this? This is crazy. The Americans, it brings a live axle. How retard the tail. And the reality was, Le Mans is jet smooth. Beam axles work great. And it also let them do other sort of funky things, which is make the brake drum bigger than the wheel. Because the brakes were always a problem with Mr. Cunningham. And you know, he, he got to be obsessional about brakes, just because American drum brakes just were not up to the job. And now at 4 p.m., the day of the race, Cunningham and the others wait for the flag. It falls. Cunningham is late getting away, but the race is on. This track here at the Concourse Club, it's a beautiful little track. It is not optimized for a car like this. This is set up for Le Mans. In Le Mans, there's no corners that are over 90 degrees. So there's only so much you ever have to turn the wheel. When you look at the specs, it is incredibly primitive with a solid front axle and these monster drum brakes and a very low revving, torquey American V8. The car is really great. When you can unwind the wheel and load up the rear suspension coming out of a corner, it's very well behaved. It's sort of that uniquely American formula of race cars. So the car, if you look at it in cross-section, is a wing. It's rounded on the front, it's got a curved top, it's flat on the bottom, comes to a point on the end. Wow, it sounds like a wing to me. I just cannot imagine how brave Phil Walters or John Fitch were driving that thing. You know, they recorded 154 miles an hour down the Mulsanne Strait. I've probably been up to 100 in it, and already, and maybe, maybe it was just me fantasizing, but I swear to Pete, I could feel that thing starting to get up on its tiptoes. I cannot imagine how scary the thing had to be. The experience allows me to further respect the drivers who raced this car and also kind of appreciate its place in, in history as to, you know, sitting in between what came before it, which was really primitive, and what got very modern very quickly just afterwards with the Mercedes Gull Wings and the Ferrari GTOs. But <laughs> when I'm out there driving it, I'm not thinking about the history. I'm thinking about the irreplaceable historical artifact especially this one, because it's the only one. 
Only one C5 was ever built. Only one C5 exists, and that C5 is the one that is here. There is something much more exciting about seeing the cars in motion, hearing them, especially in terms of exhibition racing with other cars of the period. It, it allows people who are, were not alive then to experience and sort of see what that might have been like. But even to be over here in the paddock and, and see this thing lapping is a pretty special sight. The collection is open to the public because the automobile is one of the crucial building blocks of modern society. Mr. Cunningham was, though he would not have used this terminology, a great believer in preservation rather than restoration of cars. That having been said, I don't think there's a Cunningham car, and I ultimately kept 50 of them, that we haven't had to do major work on. Active matter is a term to describe any kind of artifact that is largely unintelligible until you see or experience it operating. And these kinds of objects require a special handling. The important thing in working with active matter objects is continuing maintenance. Assembling a team to take care of active matter artifacts, such as cars, is not the easiest thing in the, the world. It, it primarily involves finding people who have the right mindset. With our cars, we try and respect their individuality, which is we allow them to show signs of their existence. We allow them to show signs of their having been alive in the world. Mr. Cunningham basically set the example for what then major Detroit factories went on to do. The GT40 inherited Mr. Cunningham's ambition in the sense that they actually pulled it off. It took a major multi-billion dollar manufacturing car company in the U.S. to do it. The Le Mans 24-hour race at last, and three gleaming Ford GTs are present. I tried to win the Le Mans 24-hour race for Americans with an American car. That doesn't mean that some other American can't take American components and build a car which can win at Le Mans. It surely doesn't mean that an American car company couldn't build such a car. Maybe things are changing. <laughs>